Hello, hello, everyone. We're going to let everyone start joining the webinar here. I see our numbers are going up. Lovely. Uh, as you all know, I love to do at the very beginning of this webinar while we're all still joining is for everyone to click on that chat button in your Zoom toolbar and just type in the chat where you're tuning in from today or maybe where you work, who you are, if you're an NSWOC, a SWAN, if you're Allied Health, uh, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from today. My name is Troy, and I'm the Director of Operations for Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Canada. And I'm so pleased to be here today uh, to be bringing another Walk Institute Continuing Education webinar. And today we're going to be partnered with Perfuse MedTech, and we sincerely appreciate their support today for bringing this education to you. Uh, and just before I introduce our guest speaker today, a couple little housekeeping items. Firstly, we're going to be having a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, so do click on that Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar again. That'll make sure that uh, both Dr. Stacy and I will be able to see your questions. So we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Uh, it is being recorded today. So if you need to watch this back or if you have to head out uh, early, you will be able to access it on our website after the fact as well. And everyone in attendance today will be getting a certificate of attendance. So do just uh, keep an eye on your inbox over the next day or two as we get those sorted for you. So without further ado, I'm really excited to be introducing our guest speaker for today's uh, presentation on getting a pulse on healing, peripheral artery disease, diagnosis and treatment. And with us today is Dr. Michael Stacy, who we have had a couple presentations with in the past, and we're so glad to have him here again. He's a vascular surgeon who joined Hamilton Health Sciences uh, in 2014 as surgeon in chief and professor of surgery at McMaster University. He earned his medical degree from the University of Western Australia and is a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. Dr. St Stacy previously conducted research for his Doctor of Surgery degree at St. Thomas Hospital in the London, in London, United Kingdom. And from 2018 to 2023, he served as Chief Medical Executive and Executive Vice President uh, Academic at Hamilton Health Sciences. Dr. Stacy has established wound healing research programs in both Canada and Australia, uh, encompassing basic, translational, and clinical research, and is currently working to commercialize a point-of-care test for chronic wound healing status. He was the inaugural president of the Australian Wound Management Association and the founding chair of the World Union of Wound Healing Societies. So with a strong commitment to improving wound care, Dr. Stacy has developed specialized clinics for diabetic foot and venous leg ulcers, and is looking to establish similar ones here in Canada. So without further ado, I'm very happy to be passing over the slides and the mic to Dr. Stacy. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks very much, Troy, and, and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as you probably gathered by the title, I'm going to be talking primarily about peripheral arteri uh, arterial disease, touching mainly in this talk on diagnosis and, uh, you know, the assessment of the patient, and then also um, a little bit on the treatment. There is another um, webinar in about a month's time, and uh, I'll cover a little bit of what I'm covering today, but I'll have a lot more focus on the specifics of the treatment uh, in that particular webinar. So just for today, as, as I mentioned, we'll be covering, our, covering some of the pathophysiology of peripheral artery disease, some of the symptoms, the clinical assessment, investigation, and then the principles of treatment. Um, so basically what we're, we're talking about here is um, when we talk about peripheral artery disease, it's really non-intracranial, non-cardiac arterial disease. And in most of what we deal with it is lower limb and where we're talking about wounds, most of that is related to the lower limb. But uh, we also do a fair bit, you know, in the extracranial part in the carotid arteries, we do a fair bit in the aorta for aneurysms. And then of course there are other areas as well, the upper limb, mesenteric vessels. So it covers all arteries uh, except those in the heart and the intracranial element. And the etiology, when we're dealing with peripheral artery disease, you know, there are many different causes of the problems that we see when patients present. The vast majority, though, are due to atherosclerosis, which I think you're all sort of pretty familiar with. But just to sort of touch on other things we see are related to trauma. Uh, some are embolic, so the arteries become occluded from a clot that's come, in most cases, uh, from a, the heart or a heart valve. Some can be infective. Um, so we see aneurysms, we see uh, sometimes arterial occlusions related to some form of sepsis, and it can be a septic embolus from the heart. Of course, diabetes is a, is a common cause that you're obviously aware of, a metabolic cause. 
And then there are some that are genetic, uh, particularly some aneurysm syndromes with Marfan's disease, Alice Danlos, and a host of others. Uh, they, these aren't common, but they're certainly part of what we see you know, in, in a regular uh, vascular surgery practice. And of course, we deal with small vessel disease, which I'm not going to touch on that very much today. And there I'm talking about things like polyarteritis nodosa, uh, giant cell arteritis, and, and other forms of uh, vasculitis, even things like spiroderma. And then there's acquired immune deficiency, which also can lead to artery problems. I'll be touching today mainly on that sort of large vessel artery disease and the key patterns that we deal with is stenosis, which is the vast majority of what we see, and or thrombosis, which may be overlaid on an existing thrombosis, uh, existing stenosis. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we see some embolic disease, we see some dissections, and we see aneurysms, which may be true or false aneurysms. So a true aneurysm is one that just develops within the artery wall. A false aneurysm is one that usually develops at the site of a uh, either an injury to the artery or um, an anastomosis where the wall or the join weakens and the the wall of the artery or of the aneurysm is not actually the artery wall. And the commonest reason we see these false aneurysms is after some sort of arterial puncture, particularly uh, for you know, coronary interventions, coronary angiograms and stents. So just, just to show you, so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about atherosclerosis. This is a carotid artery. On the left, you can see the angiogram and you can see you know, the artery on the, the right-hand side. So that's the common carotid dividing into the external and internal carotid. The, the right hand of those two arteries is the, is the internal carotid. You can see that irregular narrowed area and the material in the picture on the right is the atheroma that was removed from that patient's artery. It's the same disease that we see in arteries elsewhere in the abdomen, in the legs. Um, and you know, one way of treating it is endarterectomy, but I'll come on to that and touch on those principles later. And of course, we see aneurysms, which you see in that top slide. We see dissections where there is a split in the artery wall and you've essentially got bleeding into the artery wall. And what it does is it pushes the, the, the intima and part of the media right across. And you can see in this slide on the left, um, the actual true lumen has almost been occluded uh, in this instance. And then with embolus, what you see on that right is, is a bunch of clot that's been removed from someone's artery. Uh, in this instance, come uh, from the heart. Um, and then included an artery, in this case, in the leg. So when we're talking about the lower limb, because much of the disease that we have to deal with in patients with poor healing is um, affecting the lower limb. And the lower limb arteries can be affected by uh, problems at any level. And what I'm showing you on the slide here is just uh, don't worry about the, the, um, the things that are written on this one, but the iliac arteries at the top, and they can be quite stenosed or occluded. Uh, the superficial femoral artery you see on uh, the right side of that patient, which is the left side of your screen, there's a, a black area, which is an occlusion. There's a stenosis on the right. We see it in the popliteal arteries. We see it in the tibial vessels. But the patterns of disease are a little bit different, and so are the symptoms that the patients present with. So that's why I'll just touch on these to begin with. So when we talk about the aorta or the aortoiliac segment, we're talking about the aorta, the common iliac and the external iliac arteries really extending down to the groin. When we see patients where this is the main pattern of their disease, it usually comes on in an earlier group of patients. So generally, if this is their, their predominant disease, it's often patients under 60 years of age and they present primarily with claudication, so pain in the leg when they're walking. Uh, in these instances, the femoral pulses still may be present, uh, but if they're present, they're generally reduced, but sometimes we can't feel the femoral pulses as such. And with the claudication that patients get when the problem is at this level, we may see claudication in the buttock, um, and we may see claudication in the thigh, uh, and certainly in the calf, but 
because you've got that proximal claudication, it's an indication that you've likely got disease in the aorta or the iliac arteries. And this is just showing the sort of problems that you can, you can have in the aorta and the iliac arteries. On the left is a, a patent aortoiliac segment, but on the right-hand side, you see an occlusion of the right common and external iliac arteries. And in most instances, patients who present with this as their primary disease present with claudication, not with more critical problems. And the reason that uh, it is it usually not more critical is because they're getting collateral down through other branches that refills usually the common femoral or the superficial femoral uh, in the thigh and takes blood further down the leg. The next area is the superficial femoral artery. So that's the artery in the thigh from the groin down to the knee level. Um, and, and it's called superficial because the common femoral artery divides into two. One is the profunda femoris or the deep femoral artery, and the one that carries on down the leg uh, is the superficial femoral artery. And it's the most common cause of claudication, particularly in people 60 to 80 years old. And again, in most cases, stenoses or occlusions in this area result in uh, claudication. But in some patients who have more disease distally, they may end up with uh, ischemic rest pain associated with this. Some patients even with significant disease and occlusion in the superficial femoral artery um, are asymptomatic. Um, and particularly if they don't normally do a lot of walking, so they may not walk far enough for it to be symptomatic. But some patients even who do a lot of walking um, they develop very good collaterals. Uh, and in that sort of instance, even though they've got an occlusion, they may not have any associated symptoms. In these instances, we feel the femoral pulse. It's usually normal, but we may not feel the popliteal or the foot pulses. And this is just showing you an example. So on the, on the left-hand side there is the uh, pat a normally patent superficial femoral artery. But on the right side, you can see a little bit of it at the top and then uh, it just stops, and then you go further down, uh, lower down, that's the popliteal artery, uh, and, and that's reconstituted by our collaterals. Um, and then the other pattern of disease is tibial artery disease, often called distal disease. Um, this is a pattern we typically see in patients with diabetes. Um, patients with diabetes can have problems in their arteries elsewhere, but they particularly have significant problems in their tibial vessels. And in some patients, that is where their dominant problem actually lies. Uh, again, this pattern also in patients who don't have diabetes tends to come on in an older age group, those over 80. And here we find there are femoral and popliteal pulses, but no pulses palpable in the foot. And this is the sort of thing you can see on angiogram. So just showing you here, popliteal artery uh, at the knee level, this uh, divides into three, the anterior tibial, posterior tibial and perineal arteries. On the left, they're essentially all open, although there's probably a little disease in that posterior tibial. But on the right-hand side, we can see that all three of them occlude at different levels um, and there are no pulses in the foot. And when patients have this level of disease, they still get collaterals down into the foot, but because they um, they really don't have a lot of other blood, uh, vessels taking blood down into the foot, then they're more prone to get problems with ulcers, with ischemic necrosis and with rest pain. And there's some other odd patterns of disease we see where it's predominantly the common femoral artery that is affected. So here in this angiogram, you see Patients got really healthy looking iliac arteries and, and a good looking superficial femoral and profunda femoris artery, but where those lower two arrows are, you see the shadowing uh, in those common femoral arteries. And usually these are very calcified plaques, um, but they're very amenable to treatment if, if they're causing symptoms. So how common is peripheral artery disease? Well, um, depending on how it's defined and what population you're looking at, uh, you know, the numbers vary a little bit, but in broad terms, uh, about 10% of men at the age of 65 have some evidence of peripheral artery disease, and that rises to as high as 
23% are the, over the age of 75. For women, it's about half of that rate. Um, so women are less prone to get significant problems with artery disease. And the other thing we have to remember with these patients, when we see them, they may come to us as a vascular surgeon, but they commonly have vascular problems elsewhere. And the common areas they may have it is cardiac. So they may have angina, they may have heart failure. Uh, they may have carotid disease. So they may have stroke or transient ischemic attacks. And they also may have renovascular disease which can lead to renal failure and needing to go on to dialysis. And that's often uh, associated with patients who have diabetes. Um, but certainly we, we have to think about the patient having those problems because ultimately it's one of those problems that is more likely to uh, limit their lifespan than the artery disease in the lower limbs itself. So what are the risk factors? Well, smoking, as we all know, is the dominant risk factor. You don't see this um, nicotine staining of the fingers that much these days, but it's surprising and do still see some patients who come in and there's, there's, you don't even have to ask you know, what their risk factors are. You know that smoking is the dominant one. Um, and then the other thing, just to sort of reiterate, is uh, the age-related element of peripheral artery disease. This is just showing it increases as people get older. This is combined prevalence for men and women. Um, and, and this is prevalence, not incidence. Um, but as people get older, they're more likely to get peripheral artery disease. As I mentioned, women are less likely to get it than men. The ratio is about two to one men to women. And with age, um, that difference decreases. So as women get older, they're um, likelihood of having peripheral artery disease starts to get closer to that of men. So one thing we're always considering in patients who have peripheral artery disease is the modifiable risk factors. So what can we do to try and prevent the progression of the disease? Um, you know, when as vascular surgeons, we see a patient with some problems, um, it's always, you know, how can we stop this getting worse? We can't necessarily make the plaque and the atheroma go away, but there are things that we can do to help, you know, slow down the progression. And clearly one of the, the, the biggest things which is within the patient's direct control is stopping smoking. Not always an easy thing to do. And then having good control of their risk factors helps to slow down progression. So good control of their diabetes, good control of their blood pressure, good control of their elevated cholesterol levels. So they're important things for people to focus on, for patients to focus on you know, when they, they come with artery disease. So even if their artery disease you know, is reasonably advanced, this will still help to reduce uh, the progression. And particularly if we intervene, if we do any procedures and they continue to smoke, they continue to have the risk factors uncontrolled, then their likelihood of restenosis is much, much higher. So how do we assess patients with peripheral artery disease? So one of the key things is the history. And you know, I think uh, oftentimes as a vascular surgeon, we get patients, you know, they've got leg pain and query peripheral artery disease. So it's it's really, and, and we spend a lot of our time just, you know, getting a thorough, um, a detailed history from the patient to try and understand is it peripheral arterial disease at all? Because there are particular features of peripheral artery, artery disease and obviously examining the patient and then ultimately doing some form of imaging. So the main symptom that these patients come along with uh, is intermittent claudication. So what that is, it's a pain that um, patients develop after they've walked a certain distance. So this is not a pain that is there when they're sitting, when they're lying, when they're standing and not when they first start to walk. So it's only after they walked a fairly consistent distance. And it may be, you know, 10, 20, 30 meters. It might be half a kilometer. Um, they get a pain and it's usually located either in the calves, the thighs or the buttocks. Um, and it ultimately, some patients, when it first, when they first develop the problem can walk through it so they can keep going and it settles. 
but in some patients they they ultimately do have to stop uh, and when they stop the pain goes away within a few minutes so um it is one of the important things for us to understand when we see these patients is to ask how far they can walk and then you're assessing whether it's actually really a problem for them or not and in many patients with peripheral arterial disease it's not a major problem for them we also want to know is it progressing or is it staying quite stable because it again helps uh, with the assessment and and helps determine whether you should be treating or intervening or whether you're better to be conservative in your management it's important to know that that there are a lot of other things cause leg pain uh, with walking and this is where it's important to be you know taking that clear history because the the pain that people get with intermittent claudication is coming from muscle so it's because there is not sufficient blood when the patients walked that distance, not sufficient blood getting into the muscle. And so the muscles really starting to generate some, some pain sensation because it's, it's not getting the nutrients that it needs to continue to work at that level. But when they first start walking, you know, the muscle does get enough, um, but it's that extra that it needs once you walk further. And it's important to differentiate between hip and knee pain. There is um, a, a problem, you know, with spinal stenosis that can, in some ways, mimic um, intermittent claudication. And sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate. But in most cases, spinal stenos stenosis is associated with pain in the back, associated with pain when sitting or standing. Um, it's not just limited to walking. Sometimes it's when they first start to walk, uh, whereas with claudication, they don't have it when they first start to walk. It's only after they've gone a fairly consistent distance. And the other thing that can people get confused is, is peripheral neuropathy. So thing with peripheral neuropathy, it has specific features of pain. It's usually a burning sensation, um, and there may be some associated... Uh, sensory loss. So they may have pins and needles, they may have complete loss of sensation. Um, and generally that pain, that burning sensation they have is they're predominantly at rest and not particularly uh, affected by walking. And then the other pain that patients get is rest pain. And, and, and this really is indicating to us that they've got a more critical problem but again, it's important to be sure that what they're having is actually rest pain that is associated with a vascular problem. So the key features of ischemic rest pain is that it occurs mainly at nighttime. The patient may have some of it during the day, but they notice it at night, particularly when the other um, sensory distractions uh, have gone, which then makes their, you know, this perception of pain greater. It's usually like located in the foot. It's not uh, very rarely just located in the leg. And, and oftentimes it's associated with areas of ischemic necrosis or ulceration. Sometimes it's there without ischemic necrosis or ulceration, but more often than not, there is other skin chains that's, that's present. And the other key thing about um, ischemic rest pain is that most patients who get it find that they can relieve the pain by hanging their foot over the edge of the bed, or if they get it through the night, they get up and walk around, so have their leg dependent, which enables more blood to get down to the foot, and that helps to reduce the pain. As I mentioned before, it's an indication of severe ischemia, and generally, in most cases, an indication that we want to try and do something to improve that. Um, sometimes we get, we're get sent patients with pain at rest, um, and, and there is a confusion whether it's ischemic rest pain or whether it's you know some other sort of pain. And this is where getting a sense of the nature of the pain. Um, so as I mentioned before, burning, oh, sorry, neuropathy has more burning sensation associated with pins and needles and reduced feeling. They may have nerve root compression, again, usually has some of the other elements uh, of nerve loss. Uh, joint pains can do this. So people with severe problems in their hip and their knees also get uh, you know, pain when they're in bed at night and similarly with back pain. So, you know, it is very important to take a detailed history to try and determine uh, what is going on. 
Um, so when we assess uh, the lower limb in patients with peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease, obviously we're examining them. We do a general examination, just checking for other sort of medical issues, particularly checking their pulse, um, you know, their blood pressure, yeah, looking for any cardiac issues, looking for an aortic aneurysm. And then, of course, we feel the peripheral pulses. Um, and when examining them, we also look, you know, for any pressure areas, for areas of ulceration or gangrene and, and or ischemic necrosis, uh, but particularly looking at the toes and the feet uh, and the pressure points on the feet. We do a Burgess test, which is a, it's a very simple clinical test where patients sometimes come in and they've got quite red feet and sometimes it's confused for cellulitis. But when you actually elevate their feet, uh, that colour goes away. And that's that's the Burgess test that tells you that what you're dealing with is a problem of ischemia. You also look at, you know, the colour, the temperature and the capillary refill. So if it's got a delayed capillary refill, it suggests it may be an arterial disease. I was just said here, it's not always reliable because sometimes cold weather can, you know, create some of those changes without there actually being an artery problem. <clears throat> so when we think about the severity of the problem that the patient's got, um, you know, we're looking at the severity to understand what we should do about it. And we really do need to base that on the symptoms. We can always look at x-rays, we can look at scans, and they tell us what occlusions and narrowings people have got. But with the same appearances on a, a, an angiogram or an ultrasound scan, the symptoms can be very variable. You know, some, in, so the spectrum I've just put here is they can be completely asymptomatic uh, with the same pattern of disease. Some will have intermittent cortication. Some may go on and develop breast pain with associated tissue loss, with ischemia, uh, ischemic ulcer, or with ischemic necrosis. This is just showing you Burgess test. So this is a patient uh, that came in. You see their feet on that right side. That's what they look like when they're, they're sitting or standing. Uh, so this sort of reddish color. And you can sort of see why they might, they might get confused for cellulitis. But... A simple test is to just lay them down and lift their feet up. And what happens usually within about 30 seconds, if it's all ischemic rubor from uh, peripheral artery disease, their, their feet uh, go a pale colour. Or they certainly lose that sort of reddish. Sometimes it can have a sort of purplish hue to it, that colour, but it goes with elevation, as I said, usually within about 30 seconds. A simple bedside test that... It you know, can help us to say, actually, this is not a, an infective problem. This is a problem of ischemia. We also look, you know, when people have ulcers to see if there's any areas of necrosis within the ulcer. So any areas where there is black necrotic tissue uh, indicates to us that most likely there is an artery problem. It might be a small vessel. It might be a large uh, vessel artery problem. And then, of course, we look for, um, you know, frank ischemic necrosis. Um, it, it's sometimes, and it has been called dry gangrene. This is not really gangrene because you know, gangrene, as people always sort of think of, is caused by Clostridium welchi, um, quite a specific problem. But in this type of change we're looking at here, this is really ischemic necrosis of the tissue. So you can see, you know, on the left there, some black areas on both the great toe and the second toe. And on this um, right-hand side, you can see certainly more change in the second toe, but other superficial areas in other toes. So certainly gives us a clue that there's a problem. And one of the challenges can be if that tissue gets infected, we mostly call that sort of moist necrotic tissue or infected necrotic tissue, but people do call it wet gangrene at times. It's not actually gangrene, um, but, you know, an infected necrotic tissue, uh, as you can see from this slide, a lot of inflammation around that in the healthy tissue. So it definitely can lead to progression of the ischemia. So how do we assess patients who've got peripheral artery disease? So 
we do a number of things, um, looking at, you know, the potential risk factors, looking at other potential causes for um, perhaps impaired healing if they have wounds, uh, but also, uh, you know, looking for things like diabetes, assessing their lipids, um, assessing for other things like um, anemia, you know, which, which may also uh, impede healing, but may also contribute to other symptoms that the patient has. The user knees are looking for renal failure in particular. So simple things we can do. Ankle brachial index, you, I'll, I'll touch on that very briefly. Um, duplex scanning, which I'll just show you the principles of that. And then angiography is ultimately what we do if it's severe enough to uh, need treatment. But we usually reserve angiography for patients who need treatment. And these days, the common modalities uh, is CT angiogram or in some centres, MR angiogram. The ordinary old angiogram, like 20, 25 years ago, that was the main uh, treatment that was done. But now that's more reserved for interventions like angioplasty and stenting. So the Dopplers, I think you're pretty familiar with. So this is, you can see, this is actually a patient with venous disease, but using a handheld Doppler, a cuff on the ankle, you measure the pressure and you also measure the pressure in the upper limbs. And then you create a ratio. Uh, and what you look at in most instances is the higher pressure uh, from the ankle uh, over the, the pressure from the arms, the higher pressure from the two arms. Uh, and that gives you the ankle brachial index, which normal uh, is generally between 0.95 and 1.1 and 1 1.3. Um, for some some um, sort of publications suggest a slightly higher level for normal, so 1.4. Um, but certainly above that 1.3, 1.4, the problem there is, the cuffs are not able to compress the vessels. Um, and so you're getting artificially elevated levels. Now, normally the blood pressure should be in, in the leg, should be the same as in the arm if everything else is normal. Um, but because there's variability in the size and using different cuffs and things, so there is a range of what's regarded as normal. Anything below 0.95 down to about 0.6, in most cases, those patients will have some level of claudication. Some may not, um, but generally that's the symptom they present with. And then those below 0 0.6 down to about 0 0.3 usually have uh, rest pain, uh, generally have some tissue loss or ischemic necrosis or ulceration. And um, those you know, with very, very low pressures, uh, less than 0 0.3, usually have a very critical underlying problem. Um, and then the, the, the next step, if we've identified a problem um, and we want to go on and, and sort of look at it further to see where the, the problem primarily is, these days the next step in most instances is to do an, an ultrasound scan, sometimes called a duplex scan. In, in reality, um, these are actually at one stage they were called triplex scans, but uh, it, it's called duplex because you're looking at uh, the, the imaging to see if there are any changes in the vessel. And then you're looking at the flow velocity. The triplex part is that most of these scans now are done on color flow. So that, that adds another dimension. So you're looking at the cross-sectional cross image um, to see if there's areas of narrowing. Uh, and then you're looking at the, the flow velocity, as I mentioned. The thing with um, ultrasound scanning, it's non-invasive, unlike an angiogram. Um, it's safe, it's painless, it's generally quite accurate. However, it's a little bit time consuming. Um, <clears throat> the access to this is increasing. They are more accessible than they were, but not everywhere. And certainly in remote areas, you know, getting access to a, a, an ultrasound scan is not that easy. Um, and there are some limitations to it, particularly if arteries are very calcified, it can uh, struggle to some extent. So just put together a series of um, uh, images here of arterial ultrasounds, which um, just give you a little bit of um, indication of, of what's looked at. So if you look at the top one, 
So what you can see in the, the very top of that one on the top right, that, that dark area where you see that red signal, that's the artery. And you can see the walls are nice and smooth. And then when you look at that image, it's a, just a nice consistent red image. Um, and then you can see the little, within that, um, there's a couple of little cursors placed within that. They're measuring the flow velocity. And just below that, and that, that sort of graphical part of that image, so that gives you the flow in centimetres per second. And this is 100 centimetres per second, which is normal. If you go down then the three at the bottom, they're all essentially from the same patient. Um, so they're looking at the mid superficial femoral artery. And if you look at the one on the very left, so this is without any color, you can see those sort of white lines of the artery with the black in the middle. But if you look at it towards the left, there's a bit of white irregularity and more to the right, there's some white irregularity. So this is telling you there is not a fully normally uh, open vessel there. And then when you go to the one in the middle, so they've added color. And what happens when you've got some stenosis is you get turbulent flow. So generally, if you've got flow in one direction, uh, flowing going towards the probe, it, it's red. If it's going away from the probe, it's blue. And when you get multiple colors like that, it's telling you you've got some turbulent flow. And that turbulent flow is created by a stenosis. And then the, the image on the right is the same patient. They put the little cursor in that area. And then when you look at the graph below, you can see that the velocity of flow there is over 300 centimetres per second. And that's indicating that patient uh, has a, a severe stenosis that's there. So that's, that's how ultrasounds generate their images and that's how they're interpreted. More commonly, this is what you would probably see is some form of uh, graphical a representation of the arterial ultrasound. And what you see here is, you know, different levels down the arteries. You'll see the velocity is quoted. The type of flow, if I just go back, um, biphasic flow is where it's flow up and flow and then above and below the line. Um, and then in very normal arteries, we see a, often see a little third Peak. We don't see it on any of these ones here, but biphasic or triphasic flow is generally a good sign. Monophasic flow is usually when there's just this constant uh, low level of flow without that arterial pulsation. And that's usually when you've got an artery that's either occluded or it's looking below an occlusion, you see that monophasic flow. <clears throat> but this is often what you'll see you know, being reported if you look at that right leg. Um, was a mild stenosis in the mid superficial femoral and a mo moderate, that's probably moderate to severe looking at those velocities. And then on the other side, you'll see they found no flow in that distal superficial femoral that's occluded. And then below that flow is monophasic, indicating that there's very low flow. Commonly, most centers now also incorporate ankle brachial pressure indices. And you'll see they've, they've put them down there, certainly much reduced in the left leg um, almost normal on the right in spite of those uh, stenoses. And then most places will also do toe pressures and toe brachial indices as well. And then the next thing we come on to is angiography. And, and as I said before, this we really reserve for when, you know, patients have got a problem that we feel needs treatment. So if their problem is not so severe clinically, so they may have definitely significant changes on ultrasound, but if it's not troubling them to any great extent and they can manage with it, then we don't contemplate intervention at that point and we don't go on to angiography. The common types of angiography that are used, as I mentioned, MR angiogram or CT angiogram. And then the, the other type is, dis, is digital subtraction angiogram. That's what we do when we're actually directly puncturing the artery. Uh, and putting wires and catheters into the artery. MRA and CTA, basically the patient has an injection of contrast into a vein and then the MR or the CT is run and the images are captured. And they can all give us pretty good detail uh, of the arteries. 
Um, sometimes some of them are the CT and the MRI can be a little more limited with the vessels below the knee, but in most cases, they give us pretty accurate detail. So then when do we think about intervening for patients with peripheral artery disease? So as I've already mentioned, it's patients who have rest pain or significant tissue loss. In almost all cases, we treat these because in these instances, the limb is at risk. And with patients with claudication, we don't necessarily treat them if they're managing or if it's not a problem for them. Um, so um, only if it's very disabling or, or restricting them severely would we consider um, doing uh, any sort of intervention for those patients if they're walking very short distances. Um, then, then we would consider it in patients with just claudication. We always, as I mentioned before, we look at uh, medical non-interventional management in peripheral artery, artery disease, so managing the systemic complications, managing their risk factors, and doing things to improve their leg symptoms. So dealing with the smoking, weight control, there's some good evidence that that helps, as with blood pressure and lipid control. There, and we usually do add in drugs like antiplatelet drugs and ACE inhibitors are often helpful for reducing uh, complications related to cardiac issues. Other things, um, you know, have been uh, used as well to try and help improving uh, their leg symptoms. Smoking sensation is good. Weight loss doesn't really help uh, with their, their walking symptoms. Exercise can be very effective and helping people to increase claudication. So increase the distance they can walk before they get their claudication. Uh, so sometimes a combination of smoking sensation and exercise, often adding in you know, statins and uh, antiplatelet agents, patients with claudication can actually significantly improve the distance they can walk. There have been some drugs like uh, vasodilating drugs like silostazole that have been tried. They've not really been that particularly uh, effective. And then ultimately, you know, in patients who, who do have ongoing problems that are significant or do have critical ischemia, then some form of revascularization is needed. And as I said before, the, the, the goal of revascularization is to reduce rest pain, is to create ulcer healing and ultimately limb preservation. Um, so what what you know uh, revascularization revascularization does it improves not only the large vessels, but when you're talking about wound healing and limb preservation, it's the microcirculation that improves as well. So we do that uh, commonly these days with angioplasties and stents. Uh, we'll use bypasses at, at, at various points, um, which may be synthetic, they may be vein bypasses. And then sometimes we'll do an endarterectomy and a patch if it's very localized disease, say in that common femoral that I talked about before. Uh, and then we, in, in patients who either don't have any revascularization options, but still have you know, very significant problems, we do have another option of improving microcirculation. That's using the muscle pump activating device, um, which is really got some emerging indications for use in patients with um, significant peripheral artery disease. And I'll just quickly go through some of the evidence for that. So there's been a fair bit of work in the last five to 10 years looking at both healthy subjects and subjects with arterial disease. And what we know from those studies is that um, when we look at the femoral artery blood flow, um, there is an increase in blood flow velocity and also blood flow volume um, in healthy subjects who use uh, the muscle pump activating device. There's also an increase in laser Doppler flux on the foot. And then with laser speckle contrast imaging on the foot, that also increases. That's been sort of carried over into patients with artery disease itself. And once again, we see similar changes. Uh, and there've been studies looking at both the femoral artery and also the tibial vessels. We see improvement in flow volume and velocity on ultrasound. We also see improvement just using laser Doppler. And with laser speckle contrast imaging, um, which is the laser is really assessing microcirculation, whether it's the standard laser Doppler or the laser speckle contrast imaging, 
it's really looking at the microcirculation in the skin. And again, good evidence that it does improve that in patients with artery disease. Oops, sorry. Um, this is just showing you, you know, what a, a laser speckle um, contrast imaging does. Um, so you see, this is actually a patient with a wound at the ankle. You see it baseline. Um, there is this sort of white area, which is uh, an increase in microcirculation that happens with pulsation. This image sometimes pulsates, but uh, are not on this occasion. When we look at when we have the muscle pump activated device in place, then this is the sort of enhancement that you get with each contraction of the muscle pump activator. So that activates the, the muscles in the lateral compartment and anterior compartment of the lower leg. Uh, and as they activate, it increases the blood flow, as you said before, but it also increases the microcirculation. So lots of good evidence, um, you know, with what it does in normal subjects and people with arterial disease. When we look at patients with arterial ulcers, there are also really primarily case studies um, looking at these patients. Uh, and what they do show is in reduction in pain. And certainly a number of case studies show an increased uh, ulcer healing. So what that sort of leads to for us in patients with peripheral artery disease um, is we see this as a potential adjunct in those patients who may have delays in accessing revascularization for peripheral artery disease. So they may be you know, having problems getting a, a date for a procedure. They may be in remote areas where it's hard to get to see people uh, or they may need medical optimization before they have something done. So there's an opportunity there, particularly if they have tissue loss and rest pain to think about using the muscle pump activator. And of course, you know, as a vascular surgeon, there's always this population of patients who we've done reconstructive procedures on and, and you know, the, ultimately some of those, you know, don't, work and then we've got to the end of our options and then some patients when they get to that point clearly have such tissue loss that they need an amputation but other patients don't have that sort of severe or critical extensive tissue loss and they you know we, we look at other options to try and reduce their pain and potentially help their wounds to heal and this is where there is an option of using the muscle pump activation device rather than going straight to an amputation. And then, of course, there are other patients with small vessel disease who actually have good large vessels um, and they have ulceration associated with that. So this could be a vasculitis, an arteritis, things like scler scleroderma. Again, with those patients, we don't have a lot of other treatment options, but this, this in some instances, in case studies, does help those patients. So... At this point, I'm going to, to pause. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been, in November, I, I will have another talk where I'll focus a little bit more on the details of the vascular interventions. I will just you know, cover some of the elements here again, uh, just to go over them once more, but the detail will be more about sort of uh, vascular surgery interventions, you know, balloon angioplasties, bypasses, endarterectomies, et cetera. So, I'll pause at this point and I'm happy to um, take any questions if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Thank you, Dr. Stacy. This has been really, really interesting and we've got some great questions here. Um, I'm going to start maybe a little bit towards the end here. Uh, Lorna was just asking um, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, we treat the claudication with angioplasty if they're having complaints or difficulties. Can you explain why? And without the angi uh, angioplasty, is it necessarily going to uh, result in ischemia to the extremities in, in all cases? Yeah. yeah, so it's not necessarily going to result, you know, in critical ischemia. Um, the, the key things, if you if we see someone with, um, let's say they've got a, you know, stenosis, tight stenosis somewhere, two things we, we do. One is we try and treat the risk factors because that helps to stop it progressing. So if you can halt it or slow down the progression, then they don't necessarily go on to develop um, areas of ulceration or ischemic necrosis. And then the second thing um, is to encourage exercise uh, because if you've controlled their risk factors, in particular, stop smoking, you get them onto an anti-platelet and they exercise, then 
they open up the collateral vessels that get more blood down there. And we frequently see patients, particularly with superficial femoral disease, uh, who, you know, over a period of time can significantly improve the distance they can walk before they get pain. And in some patients, the pain actually goes away. Um, so that's that's the target. And But then if they are very limited with their walking, it's a much shorter distance, then yes, we would look at uh, some form of intervention and if suitable, angioplasty and stent, particularly in stenosis, uh, would be the, you know, the first go-to option but at the same time, managing their risk factors. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, thank you for touching on that. And for uh, yeah. those in the chat here who are just double checking what uh, MPA stands for, it's muscle pump activator. And that's what we were talking about towards the end there. Uh, <clears> yeah, and that's, the and that's yeah. you'll all know that as the gecko device. Um, so <clears throat> it's the only, the only device that actually does that. Um, and, you know, certainly I think, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of lot of evidence around for its use, but as we're seeing more and more evidence of its use in normal subjects and people with artery disease, um, the indications are starting to become evident. To be honest, a lot of vascular surgeons probably don't really know this this literature that well. So one of the things that uh, you know we'll be, I'll be sort of in the process of doing is, is trying to you know, help them to appreciate this is a, an option they have in those patients who they may have run out of options or who are waiting, you know, to have something done. Thank you for touching on that. That was one of the questions that just popped up as well. So that's perfect. And we had a couple of questions, both in the Q&A box and in the chat about spider veins here. And essentially we're asking, um, uh, can spider veins on the legs that aren't painful cause any problems in the future? And do you recommend any treatments for uh, spider veins, such as laser therapy, injections? Someone's messing, uh, messaging yeah. in the chat saying um, scler uh, sclerothera or uh, sclerotherapy. Yeah. 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 So spider veins are really on the venous side of the, the equation. So what I've been talking about here is, is arterial issues. Spider veins are really you know, related to the venous system. Um, spider veins may be associated with some significant incompetence in either the superficial or deep veins, but in some patients, they're not. Um, do they absolutely need to be treated? In most cases, not. They're mostly treated from a cosmetic perspective. There are some patients who do have big veins that you know get uh, big spider veins. When I say big, I mean, the veins close to the surface. Um, they're slightly bigger than some of the little spider veins that people see, but they can be uh, damage with trauma and they sometimes bleed. Um, so sometimes there is a good medical indication to treat them. Uh, but in most cases, it's done more from a cosmetic perspective. The main way these days of treating them is with sclerotherapy, which is injection um, of a sclerosant. Um, laser has been used in the past, but it's not in most spider veins, the, the common treatment these days. Laser is reserved for treating the incompetent larger superficial veins in the leg, so the greater saphenous vein or the short saphenous vein. Thank you for touching on that. Uh, we have a couple questions here. We'll maybe go to this one since we were talking about uh, um, ankle brachial indexes before. Is it still a benefit to doing this if a patient has already undergone an angiogram? Um, yes, yes. So, you know, what, what we do and we've done... Um, so when they're saying angiogram, um, I mean, we do angi angiograms when we're contemplating interventions. So if you're doing it as part of your assessment and they've gone on and had an angiogram, does it help you if you do it? it it's helpful if you're going to do an intervention and then you're looking at the response to that intervention. So to have a baseline is always very helpful in these patients. And then if you do something, then we generally do monitor them with ultrasound and monitor their ankle brachial pressure indices. So seeing that it increases is knowing, you know, gives us a good indication that it's worked, but then we monitor it. And if it's slowly reducing, then it tells us, well, it's it's getting back to a level of problem. Um, so as a baseline, yes, uh, definitely good to have. And then as a, a, a way of monitoring progress, also important. 
Thank you. And uh, this person's asking about compression therapy uh, on patients with occlusions or stenosis near the femoral or iliac arteries. If they already have good collateral uh, circulation, is it safe to do or to use compression therapy on these patients? Yeah. So in most cases, we we look at you know using compression based on what their ankle brachial pressure index is, and so and that's usually the resting pressure. So. It's definitely, as I mentioned, there are some patients who have stenosis in their iliac or their, their superficial femoral arteries, but they still have normal ankle brachial pressure indices. So in those patients, uh, we normally do go on and use compression. Um, if we know they've got a stenosis, then we just you know keep in the back of our mind that we've just got to be a little bit cautious with that patient and if you know, just tell them if they're getting significant pain in the leg under their compression bandages, then look to take them off. But in the vast majority of patients, as long as they've got normal ankle brachial pressure indices, um, which, which indicates that at rest, they've got good normal blood supply. So they can tolerate compression. Uh, and, and if it's reduced, um, you know, less than 0.95, but more than 0.5, more than 0.6, we can look at a lower level of compression. Um, so you can still use some compression in patients you know, with reduced ankle brachial pressure indices, but anything below 0.5, we would certainly not attempt to put compression on. And to follow up on this, we had kind of two questions that came in uh, close together here. One is about uh, how frequent would you typically recommend, uh, recommend doing ABPIs for appropriate monitoring? And isn't a toe pressure more accurate uh, than an ABPI? Yeah, so a, a toe pressure... Um, in people who've got incompressible arteries, yes. So if you've got an ankle brachial pressure index greater than 1.3, some centers say 1.4, then that's indicating you've got incompressible vessels. And in most cases with incompressible vessels, uh, you can assess the, the toe pressure and you can compress the, ves the vessels in the toes. Doing toe presses is a little bit more difficult. You've got to have the right size cuff in most cases, people do it with a PPG, so it requires a little bit more equipment, a little bit more expertise. Um, so the, the standard is still uh, ankle brachial pressure index in the first as the first line, but then you know, if the vessels are incompressible, then yes, you want to get a toe pressure. And another just clarification question on this too, we talked about uh, whether it's still beneficial, but how soon after the angiogram uh, would you want to redo an ABPI exam? Yeah, um, what if we're, um, let's say we've intervened and we've done say an angioplasty or something like that. Um, we normally, in fact, immediately after the procedures, get out our handheld Doppler and just check that we've got, you know, reasonable signals distally. Um, but if we've had a good technical result, then we would normally look at doing an ultrasound with ankle brachial pressure and indices about three months within the somewhere around two to three months after the procedure, just depending on your know, logistics. And then in the first year, um, we'd usually do two within the first six months. And then if everything's stable, then do it every six months after that. But that that's monitoring more with an ultrasound, including ankle brachial pressure indices. But if all you had available was ankle brachial pressure index, uh, then, you know, because it's easier to do, not as uh, hard to get, not as time consuming, um, you could do it sooner if you wanted to, but, um, you know, doing it even within a few weeks, just to give you a guide that it's improved is helpful. But then to monitor usually twice in the first six months and then six monthly thereafter is, is a is a common routine that people look at. Thank you for touching on that. I know we're I know we're really harping on this subject, but we're getting lots of good questions here. Um kind of two parts still on the APBPIs here is uh, can there be a false normal um uh, uh, from an ABPI if vessels are calcified? Uh mm -hmm. And again, then a, another question is someone's just asking about um, whether you're aware of any um, li literature that might be concerned that uh, those with diabetes or um, those who are elderly might not have as reliable readings from ABPIs. Um, yeah. If you wanted to touch on either of those two points. 
Yeah, so for sure. I mean, certainly people with diabetes, um, they do have incompressible, they can have, not everybody does have. Um, and similarly, but it's not only people with diabetes. So as people get older, they can also get atherosclerosis with calcification in the vessels and their vessels are not compressible. So the first thing we look for is, you know, if, if the ratio is above 1.3, um, then it's indicating the vessels aren't compressible. I think that first part of that question is a really good point. Um, you know, it is possible if you think about it with someone uh, who's got some artery disease, not such compressible vessels, but you might be getting a, because the vessels aren't so compressible, but you can compress them partially. You know, you may get what you think is a normal pressure. Um, so you always have to be a little cautious in patients who have diabetes. And if their symptoms don't match what you're getting with an ABPI, then just be cautious and think, well, maybe that, you know, it is because the vessels are not compressible and they haven't reached that threshold of ratio of 1.3, but they may still be overestimating, um, you know, their blood flow. And so would this be an example or are there other examples uh, where you would recommend doing a bedside audible handheld Doppler assessment rather than an ABPI? Yeah, so the audible handheld Doppler and, and, and what that's used for, um, the approach with that is to look at whether you've got biphasic or mono, sort of multiphasic, which, which is either triphasic or biphasic flow or monophasic flow. Um, in most patients who... who so if they have monophasic flow, it's telling you they've got significant artery disease. So most patients who have monophasic flow, um, then, I mean, you're going to, in normal patients, you're going to have low pressures. In patients with diabetes, if their vessels are not compressible, um, then you may likely you know, have a, an elevated number because you simply can't compress the artery. Um, it, it's less likely that they'll fall into that sort of gray area in between um, if their flow is actually really that bad. But, I mean, uh, certainly it is an, a, an additional thing that can give you a bit more information to look at the, the, the flow itself, the flow pattern. So, yes, if you're concerned about it, you think it's overestimating it, um, then, then looking at uh, that audible Doppler, uh, and if it tells you they've got monophasic flow, it's telling you, yes, that ABPI was abnormally high um, or, you know, not not accurate, basically. Thank That's a good you. question. Maybe we'll, we'll add one more question about this, too, before we start to wrap up. Uh, going back to the compression topic again, too, um, would you be agreeable to apply light compression on biphasic and or triphasic waveforms? Is that a yes. good indication? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 So basically... Um, if you've got triphasic or biphasic flow uh, in patients at rest, it indicates that you've got um, you know, good flow. So most of those, um, most of the ultrasound scans, if you look at them, uh, you know, patients who either have no stenosis or they have some stenosis that's not too severe, they have biphasic or triphasic flow. And in in broad terms, you know, their their Doppler pressure, their the sorry, ankle breaker pressure indices are usually preserved. And so, yes, if you've got trial biphasic flow, as you know, as those that know of the ECHO program, you know, that's one of the elements that's promoted within that. And yes, uh, they are safe to have compression. Well, thank you so much. I think we're just getting towards the end of our time here, but we've got lots of people still online and some questions that are still coming in. What we'll do maybe is recommend that for those who maybe tuned in a little bit late or had to leave early there, definitely take a, a chance to look at this webinar after the fact, but we will be having a, another webinar with Dr. Stacy uh, towards the end of November. You'll be seeing some um, uh, inv invitations coming into your email very soon here and on social media. So we invite you to come back for that one where I believe you're gonna be talking a little bit more about the intervention side uh, of this here. So um, we'll, we'll kind of expand on what's been talked about today and get a bit more specific on that next step. So uh, we invite you to come out to that one. Stay tuned on, on when that comes out. And as a reminder, you will all be receiving a certificate of attendance today. We can't thank Perfuse MedTech enough for being able to put on this a series of a couple webinars here. And of course, to Dr. Stacy for sharing your expertise today. Thank you so much for taking your time this evening. And we look forward to seeing you in, uh, in about a month from now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And it's my pleasure to be able to um, present this to you today.
Thanks for the great questions. Absolutely. Okay. Have a great night, everybody. We'll talk to you all soon.